I seem to get a lot of visitors who are curious enough to come and see and hear uh, my work. But after they've seen and heard everything, they very often turn around and ask me, well, what is it you actually do for a living? And I think their confusion arises from seeing the strange mixture of machine tools, musical instruments, and sound recording equipment crammed into the building where I live and work. I've struggled to find a concise definition, but at the risk of sounding like a comic character from Douglas Adams, I use the term holistic musician to describe the vocation of musicians like me who, whose work includes uh, composition, performing, and developing new instruments and sound sculptures. I was born into a family of classical musicians, and at the age of eight, I was learning the cello and building electronic circuits, which I would often modify to produce a range of peculiar sounds in a process well known today as circuit bending. I gave one of my first ever public performances at a school concert using a kind of primitive synthesizer I'd built to imitate everyday sounds like fire engine air horns and uh, my geography teacher's bubble car. And the audience was so enthusiastic that it probably altered the course of my future right at that point. So I continued building similar projects, uh, the largest of which was a kind of portable electronic music studio on which I composed my idea of music concrete. During my teens, I was teaching myself piano and electric bass while transcribing chunks of prog rock like Focus and Genesis by ear. I was also enormously inspired by the music of the BBC Radiophonic Workshop, a department which specialised in creating special electronic music and sounds for BBC radio and television programmes. Uh, I particularly admired the witty, tuneful music of one of their composers, John Baker, which, although I didn't realize at the time, consisted mainly of recordings of real acoustic sounds spliced together from tiny pieces of tape. So it wasn't the hope of becoming a composer myself at the Radiophonic Workshop that I joined the sound engineering section of the BBC. Well, I was eventually sent on a very short attachment to this workshop, after which I was commissioned to compose music for many programs, uh, quite often using very similar techniques, uh, the tape editing and, and manipulation that John Baker had used for his music. And I've got a couple of brief extracts here. <laughs> Well, by the time I left the BBC to become a full-time composer and musician, I'd become a bit disenchanted with the whole business of making music, which had to be laboriously assembled in a studio. And I started wishing there was some way I could keep using new, unusual sounds, but perform my music live in a band with other musicians. Uh, affordable digital samplers were still years away at this stage, and my experience of using my synthesizers had convinced me of one thing, that for my ears, at least, music really came most alive when the sounds were made acoustically and mechanically by the physical vibration of real moving objects. So I began to imagine a new family of instruments which reconfigured existing acoustic principles to allow live performance, but using new sounds. I'd already been doing this to some extent for my composition work. I'd been building little musical devices, uh, but I'd, I was also greatly inspired by the new instruments and sound sculptures created by people featured in a Californian magazine called Experimental Musical Instruments, and by the work of Harry Parch, 
both of these introduced to me by my old friend, Dr. Bob Gilmore. By now, my existing house was really too small for the workshops and instruments I already had, so I relocated to an old factory building in southeast England. So why bother trying to innovate with acoustic instruments when all the interest now is in digital area of music? Well, I think it's no surprise that nearly all the instruments of the symphony orchestra and the classic instruments of rock and jazz still generate their sounds either mechanically or electromechanically. And what they all have in common is that they each have one recognizable voice. But that one voice encompasses a whole universe of subtle variations and nuances, which ensures that no two notes are ever actually the same sound. And this keeps the ear stimulated. By contrast, samplers and synthesizers, although they offer an infinity of different voices, within any given voice, the waveform between any two notes is often identical. And the ear quickly gets bored and fatigued by this precise repetition, however interesting the voice may initially sound. Of course, this aspect of music technology is continually improving. But another quality I feel it lacks is stage presence and spectacle. The audience at a live gig can easily identify with instruments where the source of what they're hearing is clearly visible and comprehensible. The audience at a live gig can, can easily identify with instruments where the source of what they're hearing is, is comprehensible and easily visible. But a stationary black box or laptop offers little spectacle or even insight into how much of the performance is actually live. And now that the income of so many musicians is heavily dependent on live performance, this becomes all the more important. So while I remain very interested in uh, the developments in new instruments uh, in the digital area, I feel that research into new instruments based on acoustic principles is equally valid. Well, the first sound sculpture project I completed at my new workshops was a set of musical railings and gates for the building itself, because it originally had no boundary between the pavement and the private ground in front. And as it spanned about 40 meters in length, I felt obliged to exploit this to create a kind of manifesto for my work. So I composed a 28-bar chord sequence built it in groups of chime bars embedded in a wrought iron structure with a score notated in nuts and bolts. And I then invited the world-famous solo percussionist, Dame Evelyn Glenny, to give a premiere public performance. And she very sportingly came and improvised on it for 20 minutes in front of a big crowd and the camera crews of three television channels. Thank you very much, Evelyn. Um, well, this installation is still there. It doesn't attract a lot of attention locally, but it did prove a very good investment as the crucial starting point for much of my commissioned work so far. The first of these was a new set of musical gates and railings for the highly successful Rochester Independent College, founded by Brian Payne, in spite of advice that pigs would fly before he could ever do it. And as a result, there are now flying pigs in every corner of the college. And so I gave them a starring role in the design of the structure. And another uh, result of my original gates was meeting Trevor Mason, a great champion of my work, who 
first of all, helped me with a successful application for an Arts Council grant for uh, another instrument called the Gitarra, one of Harry Parch's. And, um, and then he presented me with a wonderful commission to create a sound sculpture for the garden of Cecil Sharp House, the home of the English Folk Dance and Song Society in London. And this is the origin of the Sharpsichord, which I designed as a kind of sculptural tribute to Cecil Sharp, and it's with us here today. Its original intended purpose was to allow the visitors to this garden to program their own musical ideas by inserting pins in a grid of holes in a cylinder. And when the cylinder was turned, each pin would trigger a mechanism to pluck the appropriate string of a built-in harp. Well, my outline drawing uh, for this was disarmingly simple. But the actual work required to develop this into a functioning prototype was absolutely endless. And it overshot the original time scale and budget by a factor of 10. <laughs> I had to build it in stainless steel throughout to cope with all weather conditions. It had to stay permanently in tune. And every string had to be plucked in such a way that nothing touches on the way back. All very time-consuming challenges, which took me five years to meet. This, and combined with the record escalation in global metal prices, caused the funding to run out halfway through the project. But even before completion, everyone who saw it pointed out that it would never survive the resulting epidemic of metal theft without full-time security which was well beyond the resources of the commissioning society. But the many friends and admirers who had contributed so much to the funding of its completion were very concerned to see it was preserved in some way, and so was I. And so the only solution in the end was to repay the society its original contributions and effectively buy it back. And this was only made possible with great support from Tony Banks, and Brian Payne. Well, <coughs> I'd been arranging and recording and uploading to YouTube a number of video clips uh, to kind of promote the Sharps Accord when I got a call from Matthew Herbert to say he'd sent one of them to Björk. And she was now very keen to record a song with the Sharps Accord for her new project and album, Biophilia. The song in question was called Sacrifice, and its structure was far too long and elaborate to fit the cylinder in one program. So arranging it meant including a special live keyboard part, which I would have to play on the keyboard of the instrument in sync with the cylinder program. And while she was recording it with me uh, in the workshop, she asked me about the possibility of performing live on tour with the Sharps Accord. Seemed a very exciting prospect, but um, it took several very expensive months to convert it from what was then an installation into uh, a mobile structure. But I just about managed it in time, and it did allow us to perform together at eight of her shows, and to bring it here today. So for now, I've programmed it with uh, a very condensed version of a piece I wrote for the Canterbury Festival when it was celebrating the arrival of the final stage of the Tour de France at Canterbury. And for the original performance, I had a rhythm section and a much bigger, louder instrument called the ring cycle, which required 30 players and one cyclist for its performance, <laughs> as you can see here. That's, that's all you want to hear of it, really. Uh, <laughs> so. Um, so I'm going to move over to the sharp score now and just let you hear what it's doing with the tune. It's just playing the harmony part. It's going to accompany me on another instrument called the hootie scootie, which is a combination of four different elements, and three of them are musical instruments. It's one part hurdy-gurdy, <laughs> two parts phono-fiddle, and one part scooter the front wheel of which drives the wheel of the hurdy-gurdy, which means that the performer 
has to be traveling in order to make any sound at all. Thank you very much. I just feel I ought to point out that it's not an instrument I get time to practice very much. Um, so um, that's my excuse. And um, also, of course, that these are two instruments I never imagined ever playing together. They're, they arose through commissions of one sort or another, and they don't really represent my ideas in terms of the kind of electroacoustic ensemble that I've been trying to reach uh, all my life. So that's uh, time and funding permitting is what's going to be coming up next. So watch this space. Thank you very much.